What's up, everybody? We just got done with the podcast with our very own Ian Clem, the in-house long-range nerd, to talk to us all about barrels. Everything barrels. Everything barrels. We live in the barrel belt here. Barrels are supremely important to your rifle, and we talk about rifling in barrels, too, which, as we've mentioned, and as you may know, rifle gets its name from the rifling inside these things. So, big barrels, little barrels, thick barrels, skinny barrels, fluting, carbon Carbon. fiber, stress on metals, I mean, everything. We even talked about a free-floating barrel and a free-floating action. Crazy stuff. Infinitely interesting. Tune in. Exactly. Tune in. What's up, everybody? We have Mr. Ian Clem back with us today. Uh, Ian, this is a special episode, I think, because for a couple of reasons, this one's, I I feel just this near and dear to my heart. One, your first episode back since we've crossed 100 episodes, so that's pretty neat. Uh, Two, we are going to be discussing barrels. Now, you gave us a little bit of a preview when we were in some of our long-range podcasts. You know, I think that last one that you uh, were at was the, well, we were talking about F-Class and ELR. And you talked about barrel tuning, so that's, you know, that's one thing in and of itself. But barrels, we're here actually podcasting from probably the barrel belt, I've heard it described. Oh, yeah, barrel mecca. This yeah. is the epicenter for now, barrels. Can you even just go into that real quickly? So we're in Wisconsin, and barrel makers abound here. Yeah, I, so I feel really uh, a little bit, um, you know, uh, like a faker because I'm here being some subject matter expert on barrels and we live in a place where you like you turn over a rock and there's going to be a barrel maker like <laughs> if you say oh I know about barrels you should be able to make a barrel from play-doh and cornstarch and a pipe cleaner and stuff like that um, and if you can't then you should get out of Wisconsin something, <laughs> something <laughs> like that but no I think um, there were a couple really influential leaders in uh, barrel manufacturing Back in the day, guys like Boots Obermeyer, you might have heard of that name, or John Krieger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Girls, yep. So, um, you know, they have these apprentices that they take in, and they pass a lot of knowledge. And, you know, maybe some old uh, gun drill machines or rifling machines come up for auction. They're hard to find. They're over 100 years old. Hmm. But now they're available. Maybe one of these apprentices decides to go out on their own and start their own shop and, and kind of forge their own path with what they've learned. So I have a feeling that's kind of why you see so many barrel manufacturers in Wisconsin. Right. Is because there was a really good knowledge base and and these pioneers weren't, you know, afraid to share that knowledge. And now the industry demand is such that there's room for a bunch of makers and they're all doing well. So Yeah. And when it comes to barrels, the uh it's it's kind of funny as you're talking about that too. I was I was thinking, well, we're pretty good at making barrels, and we're pretty good at making beer here in Wisconsin. But barrels, beer, cheese, brats, brats, brats. the three Bs, the three Bs. Yeah, those are covered at least. Um, but yeah, when it comes to barrels, there's there's a lot there in something that visually looks so simple. I mean, it's just kind of a bar with a hole in it. Yeah. Um, but Ian, I guess. One thing that I wanted to know, and this is a classic question. I remember when I was in sports, people used to ask the coach, like, well, coach, what's the most important muscle to work out? And usually that was kind of like that that meant, which when should I be trying and when can I slough off? (laughs) Is this going to be on the test? (laughs) Right. So so then, of course, the coach was like, all of them. Uh, Get back to work. But I do wonder sometimes, the most important part of a rifle, and we're talking about a lot of precision stuff here. That's kind of your arena. Does it come down to when you're looking at your F class guns, your ELR guns, your precision guns? Is the barrel the most important part? It is. I'm going to say it is. Yeah. Um, it's. It seems like a simple part, and it's easy to oversimplify it. Like you said, what is it? It's a tube with a hole running through the middle. Um, but it's it. It's what gives the word rifle its name. You know, that's that's right. why oh, rifles yeah, shoot well, right? Um, so. You talk to some kind of old salts in the precision game, and you say, well, what's what's important? And have you guys ever heard of this phrase called the three Bs? We were talking about beer, brats, and barrels. Yeah, I, yes, thought, exactly. I, thought we, so. I thought we covered, we this covered that 30 seconds ago. <laughs> it's actually a thing, a real thing, and okay. it's barrels, bullets, and bedding. Uh, hmm. So you probably heard hmm. of you know, mm-hmm. bedding. Um, but it, action isn't in there. 
you know, stock isn't in there. Mm. Um, those things, I don't want to minimalize those things because, yeah, it takes, you know, a village to raise a rifle or whatever. But it does. That's what they say. Yeah. That's what they say. Um, the, the, the last <laughs> thing to touch the projectile, and, and that's ultimately determining your precision, is the barrel. Um, so I, I really put a lot of stock in barrels. Um, the action, it's kind of fun to talk about actions, and from a mechanical engineer standpoint, I like the way they work and taking them apart and everything. But not a, as big a contributor to overall precision as a barrel. A stock, a great orthopedic fit makes it fun to use and um, feel good, and, and you have a good uh, relationship with that rifle through the stock, um, but not as heavy a contributor for precision as a barrel. Right. Hmm. Yeah, it's going to promote accuracy right? Yeah. if it fits you correctly, but it's not actually making the rifle accurate. It promotes it promotes more of like the uh I think we've discussed in the past there's a difference between shooter accuracy and how a- accurate the actual exactly. gun itself is. Like if, yeah. if put guns, it in a vice if guns could contr- go off without a human touching anything, they would probably be a lot more accurate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but when it comes to these things, even just on the table here right now, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see it. If you're listening right now, then you can't, but we'll describe it. There are many different kinds of barrels just here on the table and many that we don't even have here on the table. And, uh, I mean, Mark and I were going through this when we were trying to consider, like, yeah, is this a full-on podcast topic or not? And as we brought up the differences to each other, we were like, holy smokes, this is this is definitely a podcast topic because we have... Uh, long barrels and short barrels. We have stainless barrels and regular steel barrels. We have, there's actually a double barrel here in front of us, which is incredible. Hexagonal mm. barrels. We have fluting, not fluted. We have barrel uh, uh, muzzle devices. Um, big, thick bowl barrels and little thin, skinny yeah. Sendero barrels and things like yeah. that. Contours, finishes. Carbon fiber. Uh Twist Jeez. rates. Oh, twist rates is another big one. Yeah, types of twists. They get, I mean, because you have your regular rifling, but then sometimes there's his hexagonal, there's chrome lining, there's yeah. not lined, there's... Different, oh, man. Different types uh, or different ways to, to rifle the barrel itself. You got yeah. Button. That's probably the one I'm most familiar with. Yeah. 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 Button. Was it, was it gouge or cut? Yeah, so there's, uh, let's see, four major types. There's hmm. single point cut. Um, there's broached, which is actually using like multiple points per pass to cut rifling. Okay. There's hammer forged. Mm-hmm. Oh like yeah, like totally your AR-15s and whatnot. You have a lot of hammer forged barrels. A lot barrels. of European barrel manufacturers are hammer forged, old mm-hmm. process. Um, and then button rifling. So some people think button rifling and broached are the same because when they picture a button, like a shirt button, it's this flat disc and they think, well... Yeah, it's probably a cross-section of rifling, and they just sort of force it through the barrel and create rifling. Um, It's a little bit different than that. Um, So we can get into kind of do an overview of all four of those Yeah, why, that's a good place to start. Seems like All right, it. so button rifling, we'll start there. Like you said, it's where the gun gets its name. It's where we call rifle. Exactly. Rifling. That's, that's, right. that's kind of where the magic happens is the rifling on the, on the inside there. So um, button rifling, you take a bar of steel... And you drill a hole, and even that, like, that deserves a couple sentences because drilling a 30-inch long hole, a quarter-inch in diameter, you guys have ever drilled a hole, and and maybe it's through, like, a 6 by 6 you're building a deck or something, and you've got a long bit, you've got an 8-inch bit, and it comes out, like, an eighth of an inch or a quarter-inch because it kind of gets a little wobbly it sometimes. Does, right. You have this big long drill bit that yeah. has some flex to it and takes whatnot. A, takes a detour. Yeah. So how do they do it? Thirty inches long. Well, it's. Have you guys ever heard of something called a spoon drill? It's like this ancient tool that looks almost like a spoon instead of a regular drill bit. I have not. Okay. Um, you could kind of picture it. Is it's it like, the one that has a? It, does it have a little point on it, and then it comes back and it goes out to a big? No, that's a modern tool. That's like oh, a Forstner okay. bit. Um, okay. I don't know enough about. Yeah, like so picture picture like this spoon, but it's sharp on the edges. And before power drills, you know they would hand okay. crank this thing, and it would dig out a hole in like a timber when you're building a ship. Oh, I think I've seen maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah primitive. So picture something like that. Only instead of like normal iron or steel, it's made out of modern materials. Um, so it'd be like tungsten carbide, something really, really hard. But it's got that same profile where like, you know, maybe 110 degrees of it is missing. It's like this scoop almost. Okay. 
and they turn the barrel usually and keep that bit straight. Oh, interesting. Okay. And then they have these bushings around the bit that keep it from wobbling, keep it really, really straight as it goes in. Yeah. But then the key is they turn the barrel like 3,000 RPMs really fast. Wow. And then they only drill in about one inch per minute uh, to make this hole. Oh. So super slow. They're pumping coolant through that long bit. All the chips and the and the um, used up coolant is coming through that that hundred degree void in the top of the drill bit to okay. excavate. So the barrel never heats up. You don't have a lot of tool pressure on that bit. You're not really forcing it too hard, so it doesn't want to bend or take a detour. So and it, all that debris is kind of getting pushed back out of the way then. So it's not yep. like you don't have to like up retrieve anything. clean and then peck again like a normal twist bit. Okay. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it comes out on the other side 30 inches later, um, you know, half hour, 40 minutes later, like maybe one or two thousandths off axis. So super straight. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine, I, I would imagine that it's almost easier for, let's say, a 50 cal versus like a 22. Or 17. 17. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't imagine. Itty that, bitty. That's got to be a, th- yeah, because, I mean, that drill bit ex- explanation or parallel that you made. I always screw stuff up with little tiny thin yeah. drill bits. The big ones are easy. Yeah. Because it's like, I right, just take a big thing and just zerp right through because yep. the, the bit doesn't flex much. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now we've got a hole, but, you know, the surface that that bit makes is not ideal. Um, it's usually five thou undersized for the bore diameter. The bore diameter is the diameter from, like, a land of the of the final rifling to another land. Mm-hmm. Um So now we have to ream it. So we go in and we make a better surface finish with a reamer that takes out just a little bit more steel. So it's taking some of those radial tool marks out that the drill left Mm, and creating a little bit bigger size, getting ready for that rifling process. And that reamer, isn't it specific to a cartridge or at least a bullet? A bore, yeah, a a caliber size. Okay. Um, And then some... Some places take the extra step of honing. They actually have a, a hone that'll go in and, and uh, through an abrasive process rather than cutting, it'll, you know, take that last five ten thousandths off or something, get it really ultra smooth. Hmm. Uh, when we get to hammer forge process, um, we'll talk about honing because it's more important to have a good surface finish on a hammer forge barrel. Hmm. But now you've got this bore size that's to shape. And so for button rifling, the button, I wish I had a picture here. I don't know if you printed one out, Mark. But No, I don't have one. Okay. I got a description of it, but you can probably yeah. do that. So it's it's maybe like a three-quarter inch long tungsten carbide yep. piece of metal that has in relief the rifling pattern on it. Yep. And Does it look uh, kind of like a dowel almost? Ian's reading my notes. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> short. It's it's not very big. It's oh, like okay. that big. Um and we're preparing ourselves to either push this thing through this hole we just made or pull it through. Mm-hmm. So a big process in keeping that button from getting stuck is choosing the right lubricant, something that doesn't break down under a lot of pressure. And by a lot of pressure, I mean, I think you're going to need like 10,000 PSI to push this thing through, mm-hmm. this steel. That's significant. <laughs> yeah. But the weird thing about button rifling is you're not cutting steel. You're Yeah, you're not you're removing any material. No. You're just pushing it pushing out of the way. It. Yeah, you're displacing it i guess so huh. you're taking steel that you know was there and pushing it off to the sides and and um you know i think it's it's high pressure but it induces a lot of stress right in the steel so um does it make the does it make and this is just me guessing about things does it make where it pushed it out and where you have the rifling grooves harder than the part that they're not pushing against. I think there is work hardening that goes on. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. that's what I'd think, especially because you have, like, grains of yeah. the steel that are getting compressed in those yep. areas. And you, I mean, there has to be work hardening for, from that violent of a process. Um, but so now you've forced this button through, and the button, um, let's say you're pushing it through. You've got this high tensile strength steel rod that's pushing the button through. You're actually twisting that at a specific twist rate to impart you know, the right um, twist rate, helical twist rate. Oh, MC right Ryan thing. appears to have brought something up. Is that a bit like what? Yeah, there's a button. What yeah, so thing? if we take a look at that uh, on YouTube, folks can see uh, what they kind of look like. And you see there's sort of a, a lead in and a lead out. It's almost like a football shape. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, it is. Yeah, and that's to that's to actually impress rather than to gouge or cut or remove material. Oh, okay. Makes yeah. sense. Makes sense. Thanks, Ryan. And then is that 
going straight? It's just being pushed straight through, or is or it pulled. turning at the same time? Pushed or pulled, but... Yeah, they can do either one. Um, some people say, hey, you're supposed to pull it because uh, sort of like um, those Japanese pull saws, they say they stay straight. Mm-hmm. Rather, if you're going to push it, mm-hmm. a saw, a push saw, sometimes it'll want to buckle. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. So a lot of people say, hey, yeah, let's pull it, but um, if you pull, then you have to make sure that you don't break the rod that's pulling it. Or you don't yeah. accidentally detach the button okay. in the middle of your barrel. If yeah. you push it, they don't even have to be attached. You can just put the button in, put your pusher, and then push it all the way through, and you're done. Right. So it's a little bit more user-friendly from a manufacturing standpoint to push. Okay. But I think the onus is on the manufacturer to have really tight-fitting bushings on that rod. So the rod, the pushing rod itself, doesn't like buckle or get yeah. off center. You can picture that button wanting to tilt every once in a while. And yeah. that can create inconsistencies in the bore size. It's like a rear-wheel drive car versus front-wheel drive car. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. So that's um, button rifling. Um, there's a couple more things to talk about in terms of that stress that we just induced when making that rifling pattern. Uh, like you were saying, some of the steel kind of compresses some of it. Um, you know, it's, it's like this torture test where, uh, the steel is now in a pre-stress condition. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you haven't even contoured the barrel blank yet. So what happens when you start removing steel from the outside of the barrel with all this internal stress on the bore, Mm -hmm. it's going to take a bend or the mouth is going to flare out at the end or as those stresses get relieved, you're removing some of the material, the stresses relieve and then they get... These are all these are all things that I'm sure relate back to some of the stuff that you discussed earlier with like barrel tuning and things like that, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, a straight barrel is good. People want straight barrels. You try to get as straight as possible. Yeah. So they go through this uh, stress relieving process. You've probably heard about like cryogenically freezing Mm -hmm. barrels or or people or people (laughs) for future (laughs) use. Yeah. I got Um, I got big plans for that. So they go through a stress relieving process. Usually, it's a it's a high temp process. Uh, I forget exactly what the temperature is, but that sort of lets the steel relax. Those stresses um, get removed. Now you're free to contour the outside of it, hmm. thread it, chamber it, do all those all those kind of things. Um, so that's button rifling. Um, hammer forging is way different. So with hammer forging, see if you can find a picture, Ryan, of like a, a, a hammer forging machine. Uh, hopefully he'll find one, but are, there are these four big hammers that are opposite each other, mm-hmm. and they strike this piece of steel millions of times per barrel. And oh, you, you cut the blank, you cut the blank of steel about two-thirds of what the final length is going to be. There's that much steel that gets stretched and oh, squeezed. Oh, it gets stretched from getting oh, smushed. Oh, yeah. Okay. Hounded it. Yeah. Oh, so you're going to cut this thing about 60% of you know what the final length is, you're going to put it through the, well, first you're going to drill, like we talked about before, but this time you're going to drill bigger than you want your final bore size to be. Right, because it's oh, going to get constricted gonna, down. Yep, yep. Look at that thing. Oh, there we go. Amazing. Yep. Oh, my gosh. It looks like a something out of Star Wars. Yeah. So uh, the, the really good ones these days, I mean, these things have been around for a long time, but the really good ones... Um, they're, they're CNC controlled, and they can actually, no, not only can they form the rifling around um, what's called a mandrel on the inside, mm-hmm. but they can actually form the contour of the outside of the barrel as they're doing that. Oh, wow. So you don't have to cut that contour later. Because I'm sure when you cut, it removes some strength, potentially. I was going to say, because you're removing, like you're not, I guess other than, you're never, are you never losing material in this process? Well, technically, by the time it gets on to a, a rifle, you are losing some material because you know you've got to cut the ten in and thread it and stuff like that. Sure. But from a from a like a waste or um, recycling ratio yield type perspective from a manufacturing environment, this is pretty cool because yeah, you can you can uh, basically plan for exactly almost exactly how much steel you're going to need for the finished product, and then form it through that hammer forging process. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you end up with something in theory that's super strong because you've you've worked hard beat it, it into yeah just like being and super hard. <laughs> yep. So um, what's interesting about hammer forging is you're not you you don't get a chance to influence the um, how perfect the rifling geometry is 
uh, after the fact. It's basically hard and hammer forged, so you need to start out with a really good surface finish on the ID of that hole before you start hitting it. Okay. And then a really good surface finish on your mandrel itself. The mandrel is, I don't know, maybe two or three inches long, and it traverses down the barrel as the, as the, it stays, it stays kind of in plane with the hammers, Mm -hmm. and the barrel actually traverses down the machine. So, the mandrel is only ever occupying a couple inches of the barrel right underneath the hammers, and the whole barrel gets gets rifled um, you know as that mandrel is is being turned by by like a separate motor on the outside oh yeah, wow, so it almost has to you're, it's almost like sc- screwing its way in almost like or tapping its way in yeah in so a way. The, the, like if a, you picture it the machine is big and heavy and it stays put the barrel is making its way through the machine the mandrel is sort of staying in one spot the hammers are staying in one spot um, but the mandrel is rotating a little bit as the barrel goes past it so that's how you get your twist rate okay in fact they can even hammer forge the chamber portion of a barrel now um, hmm. I've got one rifle at home that has a uh, um, six five Swede that has a hammer forged chamber. And um, what's significant about that? Well, it's it's. I think they can guarantee a really coaxial alignment between that chamber and the bore, because essentially it's made with um, tooling in one step. So you're not rifling the barrel and then putting it on a lathe and trying to indicate it as best you can, so that you can mm. come in with a separate tool and cut a chamber. It's all kind of one setup, one tool, guaranteed coaxial alignment. Cool. So that's that's like a benefit. Um, so that's hammer forging. Um, sometimes you'll see like a, a styre hammer forge barrel that has like these hammer marks on the outside that are kind of like in a twisted pattern. I don't mm-hmm. know if you've ever seen that. Yeah, I, I know what you're talking about. So it's like a Ruger 1022. Ruger's hammer forging some barrels now. Okay. And you can get that same sort of like neat, twisted pattern on the outside. Hmm. Is that uh, almost like when you get a Japanese knife and it has those like <laughs> those little hammer those marks on like hammer marks That's on probably it. a little bit more legit uh, <laughs> than, than this. This is just like an artifact of like the process, but people thought it looked kind of neat. So like, no, 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 don't polish that off. Leave that okay. on there. Gotcha. Got it. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so that's hammer forging. Um, now broaching. Broaching is real common with like pistol barrels. Um, simply because the tool is is really big. We've been talking about these small buttons or, or short mandrels. Now picture this tool that's maybe two feet long for a four-inch pistol barrel. Hmm. And the reason why it has to be so long is it's got these cutting teeth on it that are incrementally bigger in diameter as you go up the tool. So each tooth might be responsible for shaving off... Um, one to two ten thousandths of an inch. Mm-hmm. So you need a lot of them. Oh yeah. Um, and they're and they're and they're cemented. They're like carbide cutting teeth that are cemented to this rod in sort of this helical pattern that matches the twist rate that you want in your barrel. Hmm. So they like they they'll put a um, a pistol barrel in a machine hydraulic press again, and they'll force this brooch down through it. So one pass, you have a fully rifled barrel. Oh. Okay. Um, but that's a cutting process, so you're shaving off a little bit of steel each time. That's pretty good in terms of not inducing stress um, because your tool pressure is a lot lower than like with a button that you're pushing through with 10,000 PSI. Um, but still, anytime you cut metal, instead of um, forming it or embossing it, you end up with um, a little bit of a like a burr. Right. Um, or like so, a hard edge. Or- yeah, it's, it's like... Uh, you know, 99% of the steel will get cut as intended and like 1% will actually get displaced off to the side instead of cut. The oh. sharper your tool, the smaller your burr, but still you end up with a little bit of a burr. So they have to do a secondary process, which is lapping mm-hmm. afterwards to get rid of that burr, smooth mm-hmm. it out. Um, That's even a little bit, I mean, like, yeah, I guess when you think about cutting with a knife, you're, yeah. just, you're just separating something sure. with a really thin, yeah. You cut a piece of cheese, you look at that, that block of cheese that you just cut really, really closely, and there'll probably be like a little burr of cheese, you know, oh, off the right. one side. It makes 100% sense now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. Yep. I actually fully get it. <laughs> so the last the last process, and that's probably, you know, the most common for guys that are really into precision and custom bolt gun builds and things like that is single point cut rifling. And that's like broaching in that you're scraping off like one ten thousandth of steel per per cutter, but you only have one cutter. Um, 
and it they're you know hand ground they look like little hooks mm -hmm. um and they'll be run through a bore uh, that's drilled to size and and um and ream to size and then they'll scrape um while being rotated in the correct twist pattern one ten thousandth of steel um out of that bore and then the whole barrel gets indexed. Like, let's say it's a four groove. It'll get indexed 90 degrees. Mm -hmm. And the cutter will go back in and scrape the next groove in wow. the rifling, one ten thousandth of an inch. And you keep repeating that process until you have your final desired groove depth. That must take forever. It takes forever. It takes forever. Oh, you're paying um, for labor hours on that thing, I'm sure. Machine time, labor hours, um, hand lapping after the fact. Um but it's also very um, enabling from a customization standpoint. So, um, you know, a high-tech shop like Bartland, you know, here in Wisconsin, they can make a, um, a gain twist barrel with their CNC-controlled cutting machine. So gain twist is where you might start off one end of the barrel at uh, a one and eight twist, and you might end at the muzzle end at uh, a more aggressive twist or a faster twist like one and seven. How oh, I did not know that was a thing. That's Would a thing. You, are you so you just tw you're just finishing with a different a whole different tool then? No, that's the cool thing. No, it's the it's exact same one, cutter. Yeah, yeah. It's the exact same tool. Oh, so it's just made. Yeah, you know, if you were to look at the barrel and watch it twist while the cutter is moving from one end to the other, mm -hmm. the rate of twist would look like it's getting faster towards the end. Yeah, even okay. though the cutter is moving at the same linear velocity. Wild. That's crazy because when you think about, I guess the the natural question is why would somebody do that, right? Because mm -hmm. also like, it it seems like you're trying to you know obviously spin the bullet faster as it gets towards the end. Yep. But what is that doing? Yeah. Why, why would you? Why not just have that be the twist rate the whole time? Great questions. Yeah. So you don't want to start out necessarily at a really fast twist because maybe the transition from not twisting a projectile at all to twisting it seven uh, or one rotation in every seven inches is too abrupt of an acceleration, angular velocity acceleration for the bullet. Have you ever heard of bullets um, kind of coming apart mid-flight or blowing yeah, up? Yeah, sure. Yeah. And um, one of the reasons, one of the contributing factors to that is what that jacket experiences during its life in the, in the bore. And right. so you can either be kind of nice to the jacket and ease it into a fast twist rate, or you can, you know, slap it across the face and say, nope, you're going to spin. Going zero to yeah, a million real fast. Right away. And anytime you, you, um, you know, try and overcome its rotational moment of inertia too fast, it can result in a little bit of um, a deformation in the jacket. And that mm -hmm. deformation can eventually um, contribute to that jacket becoming unstable, coming apart as it is, it's experiencing some uh, centrifugal forces mm -hmm. afterwards. Okay. So you've kind of like abruptly started rotation of that, of that jacket. The jacket is relatively thin to begin with. You're shooting high velocity cartridge. Um, that all contributes. And maybe you're your rifling profile or your land profile is fairly abrupt as well, meaning it's fairly square and fairly deep. Mm -hmm. It engraves a little bit more than than um, it needs to into that jacket. You're going to compromise that jacket more so than if you'd sort of introduce it to that twist rate slowly. That's one reason to do a progressive or gain twist. The it other makes sense. I mean, you've got being just nice like a bullet. super violent yeah. action being imparted on it like, all at once, Jim. I'll, and maybe this makes sense. Maybe it doesn't. But like, I'll give you a car reference: going zero to sixty in ten seconds versus zero to sixty in one second. Like, what your body's going to experience. I prefer one. <laughs> I know you. I was just thinking that. the same reference, but I was like, people fight hard for that quicker zero to sixty time, man. Now we're just being well, all nice to these bullets. Here. Well, if your if your goal is what do I want my muzzle velocity to be, and you don't really care how you get there. That's what we're playing with right now. Yeah. Okay. Um, I agree with you. Acceleration is fun, <laughs> but um, or like you ever see those uh, those zoomed in pictures of drag racing tires, and you watch the sidewall of the tire. Oh yeah. When they're they trying to transfer fold. all that torque right away. 
Yeah. Yeah, they're like rippling and like collapsing on almost itself. They, they almost go completely flat. Yeah. It looks like. Yeah. So pretty harsh um, acceleration, rotational acceleration of that tire. Right. Same thing can happen to a bullet. I think that's one reason to do it. Um, another reason, and this is the reason I think most people sort of subscribe to, is um, you're, you're sort of um, providing a, a progressive amount of um, back pressure and sealing on the bullet if you start to twist it a little bit faster as it goes down the, the bore. And what I mean is if you had just a, a consistent twist rate like most rifles do, you would engrave that rifling profile into the into the bullet, and in a perfect world, you'd have a line to line fit now between your newly formed jacket mm-hmm. and the bore, and no gas would get by. Mm-hmm. But you know it, that assumption is idealistic, and what actually happens in reality is the land of that of that um, rifling profile might vary just a little bit in width, and so you've now you know, formed that shape onto the outside of the bullet, but there's peaks and valleys as it goes, and some expansion gases can kind of get by it as it's going down the barrel. And you don't want that because it's robbing you of velocity, but also it contributes to instability of the bullet sure. if you have gases go past it. Yeah, and that's just because it's imparting force A from side the outside. force on the ogive, yep, okay. yep, induces yaw and things like that. So what are ways that you can sort of ensure that that doesn't happen well you can try to you can try to lap and hone this final shape so that it gets a little bit tighter as it goes down the barrel then it's experiencing just a little bit more constriction and you sort of add an insurance policy for gases to blow by Hmm. another another way to do it is to enter in some progressive rifling Um, it kind of does the same thing where it's it's uh, you've got these helical grooves on on the jacket of your uh, bullet as it's traveling down, and that helix is getting a little bit tighter and a little bit tighter. And as it does, it's sort of sealing off the side of that land bullet junction. It's hard to picture. It's hard to it's hard to imagine in your head, but that's kind of what happens as it as it goes down. So you know that to stabilize a certain bullet, you want to end at an eight twist. You know that well. I have less jacket deformation if I can start a little bit slower than that and I get the added benefit of a progressive seal as the bullet's traveling down the bore. Mm-hmm. I'm going to start at 9. I'm going to end at 8. Um, you know, sometimes guys will order, hey, I want to start at 9 and 3 quarter and, and end oh, at 9 and a half. How are they even determining that? Are, yeah. they just, are they just saying, is that just numbers they plucked out of their bum? Or I think what? it is, and I think it's, you know, they had one barrel that shot really, really well at that, so they just okay. want to replicate it. Like, oh, this and is the magic not? ratio. The magic Fair ratio. Enough. And Bartland's all too happy to say, yep, and they just type a number into their machine, and they, they get that. There so. you go. Well, and you get to be cool. You do get to be <laughs> cool because like, oh, you get to no. say, oh, no, it's not just, what, what twist rate is that? Oh, yeah. well, let me tell you. Yeah. How long do you have? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Hold on. I'm not done with twist rate. Go for it. I want to talk about. Slow versus fast, why yes. and and why yes and what's better and is faster just better, you know or yeah. d- depends on bullet weight. Of length. course, faster is better, Mark. That's what I'm trying to get the to, Jim. Kind of I'm that? trying to bait. It wasn't always like <laughs> that. Ian into it. It wasn't always like that. I mean, it's like anything with science. You you sort of like um, bump heads a little bit and then come to a consensus over time and. Um, you can't be so dogmatic that you that you can't say, well, actually, it's proven out that we thought you could overtwist a, a bullet, um, but now we know that you can't, so we'll get rid of that old wives' tale. But oh, wait a minute, is it a, you actually can't necessarily overtwist? It's a bullet? R- super hard to over. Was the theory getting bullet. back to what we were talking about before of just being like too violent of a rotational action on the bullet? Well, they thought that um, they we thought um, decades ago that. Uh, if you spun a bullet too fast, especially like a lighter weight bullet, yep. Or I think I think it it came from bullet manufacturing processes that didn't yield as homogeneous a cross section as they do now. So in other words, okay, um, they mm-hmm. haven't figured out a way to um, make sure that the jacket thickness is exact all the way around a bullet. Kay. So now it's the center of gravity isn't exactly on the axis of the projectile. It's like oh okay, tiny bit to one side or the other. Yeah, well, it'd be like throwing a football where it had a slight weight on one end. It would mm-hmm. kind of 
or why do auto mechanics spend so much time um, balancing your tires, you know, yeah, by yeah, adding okay. weights here and there? Well, same same reason. So I think some people saw some instability from high angular velocity exterior ballistics. So they thought, well, I must be overstabilizing my bullet. Well, in in truth, it was probably the manufacturing techniques of bullet manufacturers just catching up um, to get rid of a lot of those inconsistencies, to get rid of voids and kind of a, a kind of a classic. It's not me, it's you. <laughs> yeah, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. Um, the other the other kind of um, thing that was driving people to uh, use slower twist rates was they thought, well, if I only need a one in twelve twist to stabilize this eighty grain six mm bullet. Um, I don't want to twist it any faster than that because if I do, I'll be sacrificing velocity. And I can hmm. I can forgive that line of thinking because it, it makes sense. It's intuitive, right? You're thinking, well, due to dra- drag, less, yeah, like, less force is being used to just push the bullet forward as is being used to twist it. Yep. So you're kind of giving up some to get a little elsewhere. Yep. And anytime you um. I mean, let's be honest, rifling is an impediment to forward motion. Mm-hmm. Um, so okay. you're, you're increasing that, that um, component of the force that's, that's resisting that forward motion. Well, it turns out through empirical testing that although there is a relationship there, it's tiny. It's almost not hmm. worth considering. Okay. Like uh, you, you'll sacrifice two feet per second if you go, you know. Oh, that small? Yeah, super small, negligible, basically. Huh. So... It's it's nice from a consumer from a sh- shooting perspective because I don't have to think that I'm making this big trade off, you know. Right. Um, so like for you building a new rifle and you're like, man, you know, I I I could do a I could do a ten twist or I could do a nine twist. I'm always going to sort of recommend the nine because bullet manufacturers are always making a little bit longer, a little bit higher mm-hmm. BC bullets, and that'll p- sort of pad your your ability to stabilize something that comes out later that's a little bit longer that needs a faster twist rate and you won't be sacrificing exterior ballistics in the, in the short term okay. with the today's bullets. Is it, a, does it with a faster twist rate, twist rate, does it become a more versatile barrel in that? Like, let's say you're, you're shooting a cartridge where maybe you can shoot, one sixty fives, one eighties and 200 grainers. hundred percent, hundred percent. My, my competition three rates are a good example of that. Um, right now I'm all 10 twist because I need it for these really long 200, 210 grain bullets okay. for a 308. But there's these mid range matches where like 155s might really shine because they're just a really good bullet. Mm-hmm. Well, I can shoot those as accurately in my 10 twists as I can in a 13 twist, the original twist for a 155. Okay. But hmm. I can't do the, the converse isn't true. You yeah, know, that's where you yourself. really run into trouble with twist rates. Is if your if your twist rate is too slow for a big, a bigger, right? Too slow for a bigger bullet. You need a faster twist rate for bigger bullets. Yeah, heavier bullets. Yep. I should say, yep. not necessarily bigger. And but. like back in the '60s and '70s, um, you know, if someone were to um, have a like a 243 or 6 mm Remington, talked about this a couple times in previous uh, podcasts. Manufacturers made the mistake of twisting too slow. Yeah. Right. And they thought, well, people are going to use a 243 as a long range prairie dog rifle and they're just going to be shooting 70 grain bullets. Well, not so much. You know, people want to shoot 95s and mm-hmm. use it for deer hunting and dual purpose. Now you've just hamstrung yourself because you've got this really slow 1 in 12 twist for your 243 and it can only shoot 65 grain bullets ever. Yeah. Um, and people say, you know, they try the, <coughs> the 90s, 95s, and they don't shoot well, and they think, well, the cartridge is bad. So they write it off. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. Put this on a shelf, sell it to some schmuck. Yeah, this rival doesn't shoot. Yep. Interesting. Yep. Well, I know, and I'm sure people are completely tired of hearing about it, but my old 300 Wisdom, it'll eat 165s, it'll eat 180s, and then I've tried 200 grainers, and it just falls apart. Yeah. Interesting. And I think I think the Mark, Europeans. I'm the only kinda... person who's sick of hearing about your 300 wisdom. Everybody else loves it. <laughs> <laughs> we, I, we egg them on a little bit because we want to hear more. We do. We do. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, the Europeans like uh, the Scandinavians using the 6.5 Swede for moose and stuff like that. They're shooting they, for a long time. They've been shooting these really long for caliber, you know, 160 grain round noses. But they have the twist that can stabilize that bullet. Yeah. Whereas in the states, for the longest time, velocity was king. And so we're thinking, okay, light bullets shooting really fast, that'll make the, the rifle flat. 
And it does for the first 300 yards, you know, but we know better now and we want to shoot further now. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How about, um, we'll stay inside the rifle here for a bit longer. How about like, um, uh, oh shoot, um, uh, linings. So I, you know, some of the AR-15s, you see this, uh, chrome lining or you see a nitride whatnots. And, um, you know, sometimes people say, well, you get like, uh, stainless barrel and it won't last quite as long or for as many rounds as will like a chrome lined barrel. Cause I think chrome is like super hard or it something. Is, yeah. Um, you know, and then you have the regular nitrided barrel, which is kind of in between the two as far as how long it lasts, but stainless seems to be a little bit more accurate. Some people say than the chrome lining cause it's a little bit softer. It grips the bullet or something like that better. Whereas chrome, I don't know. What, what do you think about all those things? So, um, yeah, you're on the right track. Basically, the chrome is super hard, so it res resists wear. So you get longer barrel life. But as with everything in life, there's no free lunch. The trade-off is um, precision. Okay. Mm. And the reason why is because even though people are pretty good at depositing chrome onto steel, it's still it doesn't have the same dimensional stability as just a plain steel barrel. Okay. So yeah. we've just cut rifled this barrel and we've hand lapped it and it's super super consistent now we're going to deposit this chrome onto it and we've planned for a certain thickness but sometimes that thickness is a little bit more sometimes a little bit less yeah that's why i usually take i've heard people say i'm not an expert on this but i've heard people say like um a quarter minute deficit in in available mechanical precision for a hmm. lined barrel versus unlined barrel and so if you want to shoot, if you want to sustain high rates of fire for whatever reason, maybe that's a good trade. Maybe that's worth right. it for you. Yeah. Um, you know, it all depends on your philosophy of use. Um, if like that isn't AK, volume. The old AK-47. Volume versus accuracy, or as one person wrote in at, uh, to us. Uh, many years ago. Many years ago. The more rounds you got, the less aim it take. <laughs> po sure poetic <laughs> yeah yep. that was a real quote uh, that yeah that we happened. got tagged in that on instagram okay the picture was i respect that move yeah. uh intriguing inspiring okay but something like melaniting or um nitriding uh those processes um for one they add less thickness mm -hmm. they still afford surface hardening which mm -hmm. is what we're trying to get to Aren't get they like actually life. a corrosion well, that's almost like a secondary benefit. Okay. It's uh, anti-corrosion, but we've all seen like chrome bumpers that are still, you know, subject to a little <laughs> bit of oxidation. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, the main benefit though is barrel life. So, okay. it makes a lot of sense when you start talking about machine gun barrels, you right? Know, within yeah. our armed forces, is mm -hmm. it not necessarily then the the demotion and accuracy is demotion a word maybe um, reduction reduction and accuracy isn't necessarily a direct result of how hard chrome is but a little bit more what you're talking about how it has some more inconsistencies dimensional stability yep okay, okay. Yeah. i always thought of like uh, i always thought of it almost as the chrome was so hard that the bullet was it was mm. almost like almost like a softer stainless or a softer steel barrel would be just gripping the bullet a little bit more the bullet would be kind oh. of like oozing through it a little bit better <laughs> so it would stay more mm -hmm. straight or something. I don't know. That's that. That was always my impression, but I just that was completely made up. You know. Yeah. Well, you might be onto something, but <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. You don't okay. need to make so, me feel good about so that. So diplomatic. I love it. You're, you're on the right track with that. You might, uh, you might be. Let me correct you. Uh, <laughs> yes, but no. <laughs> right. Um, now, moving on to the outside of the barrel. So we have um, we have and I, going back to the table here. We have big, thick barrel. I mean, this thing right here is a sight to behold in front of me. I mean, it's it, it's as long as the table is wide, for those of you not watching right now. Um, it's a big old, is a stainless yep. barrel. 416. What does that thing weigh? Um, well, interesting you should ask. So the only reason I grabbed this out of the barrel drawer this morning was because <laughs> it had... Drawer barrels. Barrel drawer barrels. I got it, socks. It, it has some, uh, <laughs> some fresh cut fluting on it. I had to send it back to the manufacturer because uh, for ELR, they changed the, the weight limits for the light class. Mm -hmm. And this ended up being a pound overweight. So I said, hey, can you, can you uh, cut, some, cut some weight out of this thing and, and flute it for me? Um, 
so well, it looks cool now. Well, it, yeah, and that's we'll get into like <laughs> what does fluting offer? And it looks cool is like the main thing it offers. But um, in my case, I needed to shed weight, and I couldn't get rid of any other weight on the rifle. So they um, they took three pounds out of this thing. You're kidding me? No, oh this is my gosh. this is worth three pounds. And it was was it pre- was it previously fluted at all? No, it not, wasn't at all. Okay. No, not at all. Everybody knows when your rifle weighs 50 pounds, or no, I'm sorry, 51 pounds. I mean, geez, take a pound out of that thing, man. I mean, yeah, so that was worth it from that from that perspective. Whatever it weighed, that is, was just decreasing the weight. Um, that is that is crazy. I can't believe three pounds. But I guess when you look at it, I mean, how long is this barrel? That one's 34. I 34 think. inches, yeah. and so this section here is about, I mean, 70 percent of the length, and you have these big scallops going out all the way around the barrel, and yeah. I guess I could see that adding up for yeah. sure. Let's um, just take a second and bust a couple myths about fluting while we're on it. Sure. People say you add fluting, you're going to have a stiffer barrel, and that's just is not true. They're kind of getting it almost like an angle iron type thing, right? So it's harder for a barrel to bend against the straight up and down portions of it rather than it would be. Yeah. So that's using geometry as like an I-beam or a stiffener uh, L-beam, yeah. something like that. But that's, you know, for the same amount of steel – you can increase rigidity through geometry. You can't take a piece of steel, no matter uh, what its size and shape, remove material and end up with something stiffer than what you started with. Yeah. Okay. What you can do is you can say, I've got three pounds to spend on this barrel because I want to end up with the sheep rifle that and that's you know seven pounds with glass. I've got three pounds that I can afford to make a barrel out of. What's the stiffest barrel I can make out of three pounds? Is a fluted barrel. Um, okay. Does that make sense? You're going to end up Wait, with a what? bigger, a bigger outside diameter with a fluted barrel for the same amount of weight that you that you compared with a non-fluted oh. barrel. So, okay. so you you get a stiffer barrel by getting a a more. I'm just going to use the word. I'm sorry. Everybody. Fatter barrel. Girthy. Yeah. Fatter barrel. Yep. And you get a fatter barrel while still maintaining the lightness of maybe a thinner barrel by going fluted. Yeah. So now oh. you, you're you judging so it, apples to apples on a weight basis. Yes. Does it yes. M- maintain... Now I get the three pounds thing. I thought we were getting British here for a second. <laughs> it's like three pounds <laughs> for a barrel. I mean, I know it's like six bucks, but How still. many quid is that? Um, yeah. <laughs> do you get the exact um, same rigidity of the, uh, you know, that no. I guess that outside diameter? So, no. But it's just not as... It's still an improvement, though. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can increase the rigidity of any cylinder by you know increasing its its outer diameter um, per weight on a weight basis. But this right here, when when I got this barrel back after it was fluted, it was instantly less rigid than it was. I was when just going to say, yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Did you have to then tune it differently, like like tune? Your just got it back. Haven't shot it yet. So okay, that's I'm gonna. Fair. S- that's it's going to be interesting because I'm going to see. Well, did point of impact change or now with this is a cut rifled barrel, so. Uh, theoretically, it didn't have any internal stress inside. Okay, right. So when they removed that material, it wasn't letting that internal, there was no internal stress oh, to, to, to make a deviation. Okay. So I think it's going to have the same point of impact. I think it should have the same uh, level of precision. Mm-hmm. So now what's then the importance about stiffness then when we talk about stiff barrels? Because we, I mean, you go into talking about Big bowl barrels, skinny little tiny barrels, and then you have this is a carbon fiber barrel, which I know has been sort of the uh, the prom king of barrels, if you will, lately. And because they talk about how stiff carbon fiber is, what is the stiffness actually doing? What the heck? That carbon fiber has yeah. holes cut in it. That's oh, it's weird, got holes cut in it, and it has a stainless barrel inside of it. Yeah, right? my yeah. lord. Well, that's so. That's um, Stiffness is a way of, you know, we talked about barrel vibration Mm -hmm. um, in the last one. So stiffness is a way of decreasing the amplitude of that waveform, of that vibration. uh, And correspondingly, you're going to increase the frequency. So your barrel, in layman's terms, your your barrel is going to move less Mm -hmm. and be a little bit more consistent in terms of how it moves um, with variances in your ammo or your your uh, grip firmness or other things that can influence how the barrel might move. When you say grip firmness, you're just talking about how tight you're gripping the gun can yeah. influence? Yep, yep. So you're part of the system. You know, the rifle's part of the system. Um, but, yeah, you can influence how your barrel moves by gun handling. Um, 
you know, whether you have your, your stock, um, pinned hard up against a tree trunk, you know, as you're taking a shot out in the field yeah. okay. versus sure. something softer. That makes sense. Um, so people have wanted to get stiffer barrels so that they, they can, um, sort of mitigate the movement or lessen the movement of the barrel itself. Now, if you subscribe to the theory as I do, where, you know, if you understand how the barrel moves and you can plan for it moving, i.e. Um, work with it in terms of um, I want it to be moving in such a way every time the bullet is released, mm -hmm. then stiffness isn't such a big deal. In fact, you could argue that you might want it less stiff because you'd be, be dealing with bigger amplitudes, bigger waveforms. predict and work with. That are slower. slower. All of a sudden, your frequency goes down. And so now you're dealing with these big swings in your muzzle that are slower and easier to um, deterministically define. Yeah. Like on those reaction games, you know, where you're supposed to hit the button when the light turns on. Like if the light was flickering, like it's hard to, to hit. To try and find a spot between that yes. light. Yeah, it's hard to hit it. Timing. But if the if the light stayed on for longer periods of time, it's easier to hit You'd get that. it right I imagine time. it's easier to then predict what's happening if the barrel isn't like, you know. It's, right. Right. But is the only way to work with it to, uh, like, you, we've talked about tuning devices yeah. before. Yeah. So, like, on maybe a hunting rifle, I'm not going to have a tuning device. Well, unless you've got, you know, the, the old Browning Boss system. Browning Boss, or, yeah. You've got that donut thing. Is that what the Boss is? No, that's a, that's a Sims vibration laboratory like uh, makes your rifle look really cool oh dude it's hard I it's know. tough <laughs> it's, i don't even want to tell you what Jagged my dad called. i can't tell you what my dad called it yeah mm -hmm. um yeah dude like it helped but like um i don't feel good about myself that's all right Mark. Now, there's guys that are that are experimenting right now with ways to decrease barrel stiffness in very specific ways. Like I know a guy who's actually shaving off steel way back at the breach to create a weaker point back at the, at back sure. at the action to promote a little bit of bending. You say sure, like that makes sense to you. It, you actually it actually did that? make sense. Really? Yes. Yeah. Because you're creating a hinge point kind of. Yeah. Yeah. Jim, sometimes things make sense. I know, okay? and sometimes you surprise me. He gets it. <laughs> Um, how would you, for example, let's say, how would you tune a barrel like this? When you brought in your F-Class gun, it had that unique... I should have brought that in, yeah. It, it had that unique thing on the end of the barrel that you could twist and you could essentially influence... It was like a barrel tuning much, fork. Yeah, how much weight was hanging out, yeah. where it was hanging out. But with this, you just have... I mean, it's just a barrel with a muzzle device on the end of it. How would you tune this? So instead, your, your um, independent variable that you're working with is your ammo. So this oh. this can't change. Tune. You tune your ammo so that it's arriving at the muzzle when you want it to yeah. versus pick any load that, that gets you the velocity that you want and tune the barrel oh. to make sure the barrel is where you want it when that ammunition happens to leave. Okay, okay. What do you think about this? Uh, you have this carbon one over here now. Yeah, do so you use that one still? Like you still... Like well, I guess I, so. Now What's, I'm wondering why why'd you get a carbon one? Well, this one's super interesting. It is, and that's why I actually borrowed this from Larry downstairs. Mm -hmm. um, he he fits some barrels in his free time, and this is one that he had that he was telling me about the other day. And I said, "Bring it in. This is this is pretty interesting." Because, because some people fit barrels in their free time, brew beer in their free yeah. time. We're very <laughs> weird people. The winter brings the weird out in us. So. This is a little shop in like Delavan, Wisconsin. You know, they're they're everywhere. Um, and the neat thing about this one is it's a composite barrel. Composite just means it's made out of more than one material. Okay. Um, but it's pre-tensioning the uh, stainless liner on the inside by using the carbon fiber, uh, which is very strong in compression, as a compression member. So you notice... It just looks like it's threaded for a break or a, a suppressor, right? right there. Yeah. Five eighths thread. Yeah. Well, look at there's no thread relief when you look at the when you look at the shoulder down there. It just disappears into nothing, mm -hmm. and you oh, see it these keeps going. Yeah, you see these radial holes here in the end. Yeah, yeah. Well, this isn't what you think it is. This is actually a nut. It's not part of the barrel proper. It's a separate piece. That's a nut that takes a special spanner wrench, I assume, and you can basically 
tighten this down on these threads. Mm-hmm. Okay? okay. Well, what you're doing is, and some people create a little bit of a temperature delta so that they can take advantage of the coefficient of thermal expansion between the two materials to help promote the compression and, and uh, tension. Um, uh, we're going to have to listen back to that one and yeah. bring out a dictionary. But whether you do that or not, <laughs> I think w- that's what, made let's, up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it sounded legit, though, didn't it? It, did. it, sure, it sounded awesome. That's, that's all that matters. Um, you can compress this outer carbon fiber sleeve. Uh-huh. And when you do that, you're just like any threaded fastener. When you torque a, like a screw, mm-hmm. you're putting it in tension. You're stretching it. You're stretching and so it. it's yep. compressing it this way. The, the carbon, carbon fiber. The carbon, just the but carbon that, fiber. That makes the barrel stretch. Bingo. That's your that's your equal and opposite reaction. And that's how you get rigidity? That's how you get straightness. Oh. And oh, yeah, because when things get pulled, they straighten out. They straighten out. Yeah, we already touched on that. Um, so it does a couple things for you. It, um, it straightens your bore, and um, I would say that it does contribute to rigidity as well. Um, because now, you know, you've got this pre-stressed, um, composite assembly and a lot of things when they when you induce a stress in, in them, they get, um, a little bit more rigid, a yeah. little bit uh, stronger. Um, and that's what's going on here, but it takes it at an, another level where it's hard to see, but the, the stainless on the inside is actually fluted. Yeah, it is. And that's to obviously reduce weight, like we talked about, okay. but increase some surface area. Oh, for Be- cooling. Yes. Have you ever um, heard someone say, you know, they got a, a new carbon fiber barrel where it's one of those manufacturing techniques where they just wrap the carbon fiber on the steel part of the barrel, mm-hmm. like a mm-hmm. manual. Mm-hmm. And maybe they shot a lot or sustained a rate of fire that was that was pretty healthy for a while. And... They actually heat affected that carbon fiber. Sometimes you hear about the carbon fiber rotating or, like it or becoming spins. loose. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So this is this is sort of debunking the myth that carbon fiber is um, it doesn't heat up as much, or carbon fiber barrels don't don't get hot. What's what's actually happening is they're they don't feel hot to the touch because they're an insulator. No, yeah, relatively they're just trapping. Speaking. That's what I was gonna say. Like I've heard, I've heard both arguments. People say like, "Oh no, they, yeah, they uh, dissipate heat," and I've yeah. heard other people say it's an insulator. And I'm like, "Well, yeah. Yeah. which one?" Well, it's the latter. I mean, that's the truth of it. Um, when you cut through hmm. all the marketing and everything, it's that's actually what's happening. Um, there's no two ways around it. But this is allowing cooling via convection because you can tell. Um, there's an air gap all the way around between that carbon fiber and it's the steel. It. Yeah, the the um, it's not even touching. It's yeah, the steel isn't even touching the carbon fiber. The I didn't carbon even fibers. I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't want to sound stupid. But I was like, I'm like, it's not even touching the barrel. It's literally like, how just is it held affecting in place, the barrel if it's not touching the it's barrel? It's literally held in place by, by tension. Yeah, just got like two rings of contact, one there and one there, and carbon fiber happens to be pretty strong. If the ATF came by and it didn't have these slits in the side of the carbon fiber, they think it was integrally suppressed almost. That's kind of yeah, what maybe. it reminds me of, how sure. it looks. Yep. Um, so this sort of uh, allows you to have a carbon fiber barrel while not you know, using that carbon fiber unintentionally as an insulator, trapping heat inside and, you know, prematurely wearing out your barrel because it's getting too hot. That's unique. And and in this case, stress is being used for good um, in that you're maintaining the stress yep. while the while the rifle is shooting. The, the, the bad sort of version of stress that you were discussing earlier with rifling is when stress is there and then you start to take things away and the stress has to, it then relieves itself in a way that would would um, demote accuracy. Yeah, it starts to assume a shape that isn't straight. Sometimes that happens when you have internal stress in a barrel and you start shooting it. You ever see like a rifle that has a free-floated barrel. It's not touching the stock, but your point of impact starts to shift in a very mm-hmm. predictable mm-hmm. line. Okay, right. Yep. I've that's, definitely seen that. Yeah, so that's the same thing where there's internal stress in your barrel and based on the fact that you're heating that material up, some of that stress is starting to come into play. And let's say, um, you know, there's more stress on one side of the barrel than the other. Well, how do you think it's going to bend? It's going to, you know, 
It's mm-hmm. going to be acted on by those stresses and, and been in a specific way. That is unique. Getting that is back, very interesting. Getting back to the fluted barrel, that's one thing uh, during my, uh, my pre-podcast reading, they're saying, hey, if you're going to flute a barrel, you better do it very, I guess, you know, accurately or with a high level of precision so you don't impart, you know, maybe removing more material on one side yeah. versus another side. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And also, like, there's more than one way to cut a hemispherical trough in a piece of steel, right? You can use like uh, a rotary cutter that's sort of like a slitting saw that's cutting like this, or you can use like a ball end mill Mm -hmm. that's rotating the other way. Well, as a general rule, you know, um, the, the smaller amount of steel you can take with each cutting surface Mm -hmm. and the sharper the tool, the less stress you're going to be imparting into the material, into the base material. So, um, that would mean you'd want to use like a, a, a you know, four fluted, multi fluted ball end mill and take your time making this cut, traversing mm-hmm. all the way down rather than really hogging it out with like one of those uh, big slotting tools. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit, every time you try to cut too much material, you're displacing some material, cutting some material. Right. You don't want to really displace any material. You don't want to put pressure on the workpiece because that's right. what induces the stress. I'm hmm. picturing like, uh, trying to like whatever split a log with an axe right like i could use an axe which will get me to where i want to be or which is going to impart like a ton of force displace things or i could use a chisel and get to the same point eventually yeah but but just more cleanly just a lot less force you're really not you know imparting anything you're just just chipping away yeah but if you the goal is to make artisan firewood um the chisel might be exactly right up your alley is artisanal firewood a, th- a thing, or is that just a really <laughs> clever <laughs> it is now. last minute? It's a thing. <laughs> that a very very interesting. Um, Come to Ian's artisanal firewood <laughs> <laughs> warehouse. <laughs> we we got to talk about. There's a couple other unique barrels on here. Yeah. Um, one of which is hexagonal, octagonal. Um, or, I'm sorry, octagonal. Yep. Uh, octagonal barrel, and. Uh, the only reason I threw this in here was to touch on a little bit of history. Yeah, um, this is a kind of like a classic. It's also this cool gloss finish. Is that hammer forged? Um, so this one is not, but they were. This one is trying to replicate something that was hammer forged back in the day. Okay. So a lot of gun builders. So this is a modern, relatively modern build um, replication of an iconic single shot rifle, the low wall. Mm-hmm. So I took this off and rebuilt it in something else. So I just have this in the drawer. But um, the, in before the drawer. It, Ian's drawer must be an interesting. Place. It's a heavy. It's a heavy drawer. And it, and it's like <laughs> long, long ones. But um, so back in the day, these gun builders, some of them didn't have lathes, but they had files. And all these barrels were hand forged, so you can imagine taking like a lump of steel and actually hammering it. Oh my gosh, it's like the old sword builders or something. Yeah. So so it's easier to hammer something. It's hard to hammer something that's round, actually. It's sure. a lot easier to hammer something that's got eight sides to it. Yeah. And Makes then you sense. can draw file it to its final shape and you're in business. Um, there were no steel mills back in the day. So a modern manufacturer now, they take a they, they call up a steel mill and they'll order um, these twelve foot bars of four sixteen R stainless. And they'll get tons of them. Well, you couldn't do that back in the day, so you actually had to hand forge these barrels. And that's why they were octagonal. You could, I think you could pony up and spend some more money to make it round, which is kind of funny because now this is more expensive to make than yeah, a round barrel. It, right. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. That's that's pretty cool. Um, every time I see one of those, they just it just has that unique, elegant look to it. But But talk about unique and elegant. We've saved... We've saved this one here for the uh, latter portion of the podcast, but this is a double barrel rifle. What do you call it? Yeah, it's a it's a double rifle. Double rifle. And and the cartridge is this one is actually thirty thirty Winchester. That's awesome. That is so unbelievably cool. Um, and and when you first pulled it out, I remember thinking to myself, "Oh, that's cool. He's got like a double barrel twenty two. Um, because these barrels are like incredibly, like incredibly thin. Yeah. What's yeah. the What's the story behind this rifle that this came off of, and 
the barrels and the chambering and everything. What's the story here? Well, I always wanted a double rifle for the collection. I just think there's something kind of neat about it. Um, you can play make believe. I'll probably never hunt in Africa, but you can play make believe and, you know, pretend you're on a safari after some Wisconsin whitetails or <laughs> yeah. uh, charging uh, rabbit or, or whatever that you need to <laughs> that you need a stopper for. Um, so I wanted a, a double rifle, but. Let's be honest, a 450 night show, how, how often am I going to go out and shoot that just for fun? You know, it's, right. yeah. it's not going to be all that fun to shoot. I don't know if anybody ever even shoots that for fun. Yeah, ever. so so <laughs> this is, uh, a, it's built on a little 28 gauge um, side-by-side action coming from France, um, a company named uh, Chapuy. And they said, you know what, let's make this double rifle for the American whitetail hunter that kind of wants a double rifle. That's and so cool. Yeah, I think they offered it in 30-30 and um, maybe like 30-40 Craig or something like that, a couple of 30 That's calibers. That's cool. And so it comes with a set of 28-gauge barrels um, as, a, as like a set. Um, but the reason I grabbed it was because here's an example of, once again, a barrel, but compared to these... Um, almost expendable, like consumable barrels that we go through on target rifles. We screw it off, screw another one on for the next season. This is on the other end of the spectrum where a lot of handwork, hand fitting uh, went into this. Yeah. Uh, a couple features. The reason why the barrels are so thin, not only to keep the overall weight down and, and manageable, mm-hmm. is during the regulation process, regulation is like where they, they try to make the two barrels shoot to the same point of impact. Now, That's what I was going to say. You, be you're dealing so with two, two barrels steel, that yeah. are, uh, somehow need to be pointed to, yep. to the exact same so, spot. I'm not going to point this right at you guys, but you see in the front this little like wedge that's protruding out the front yes. between the muzzles. Yeah, it's not centered. Yeah, that's one of the tools that they use during the regulation process. By pushing that wedge in and pulling it out, they can converge and diverge these barrels You're as they're me. no as they're shooting them. So this particular set of barrels was regulated with a specific ammo, and that's the Hornady Lever Evolution, that real nice uh, mm-hmm. pointed uh, yeah. Yeah. Three round, and. Um, and they are actually test firing with these barrels in the white, separated, until it shoots exactly the way they want it to. And then they go in and silver solder the top rib and the bottom rib, and they have to check it as they go to make sure they haven't shifted one barrel or the other, that they're right. both still shooting. They're imparting the heat with yep. soldering, which can... They silver solder in a sling swivel stud, um, a forearm hook, uh, the lugs that actually uh, create the lockup for the breech back at the the ejectors. Um, this quarter rib they have to solder on, and they even do some. This has some really like cool design in the oh, top. Oh yeah, the matting of that. Yeah, and then um, and placing the the iron sights so that they shoot to point of impact or right in the middle of those two shots from from each barrel, and then even some quick detach um, scope mounts. I mean, this is just like. Everything about this screams fine, handcrafted, like, you can't, I mean, I I don't want to say a machine can't make this, because a machine probably can, but it also can't get across how, I don't know, if you brought this in and it was like, oh yeah, this is from a a place where a machine made it, it wouldn't be as cool. I mean, it'd be kind of like, wow, that's really unique, but it wouldn't be nearly as cool. And the fact is, machines can't make this because it actually does take that hand process of fitting the barrels together and making them. Yep, a machine can't replicate that. That's amazing. So that's why there's a lot of labor. Suck it, machines. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. We still have a reason to be in charge. Yep. They haven't taken over completely. It's not iRobot yet. Yeah. Can you talk about real quick too these scope mounts? Because you have this Razor LH here. Yeah. So that's the one I picked for for this double rifle. You were talking about uh, very fitting optic for the for the rifle. Uh, you were talking about just how these uh, what what do they call swivel scope mounts? Yeah. Some people call them pivot mounts. Some people call them uh, swivel mounts. But the theory is um, you want to be able to shoot with irons or a scope, and you want to make that decision in the field, um, depending on you know. Um, what what you're doing? Can you imagine being on like a like a mule deer hunt and being like, do I want to go and stalk that one with my irons or should I throw a scope on? I mean, like people people nowadays who aren't aware of these kinds of things would have an aneurysm just thinking about yeah, it. Like, yeah, yeah. Ah, ah, you didn't ah, not zeroed in. Ah, like. Detached, right. reattached. So there's a lot of precision that goes into these mounts as well. And I actually shot a group 
um, with this rifle uh, with the scope mounted, and then I shot a group taking the scope off and putting it back on mm-hmm. in between shots, same number oh, of yeah. rounds, Okay. same size group. Wow. Yeah, so I have a lot of confidence in it now. Jeez, yeah. But basically, it's got one pivot dovetail in the front, and then one cam, oh, and then it, cam locking dovetail in the back, and it's it's on and it's that rigid. That is so cool. Yeah, so you could take it on and off as many times as you want. I love everything about this. I yeah, and like you said, there's just like this romantic quality. Like yeah, I don't I I don't need a a double. Well, I shouldn't say I don't need a double rifle for Africa. Mark, but, you need a double. Oh, for Africa. Well, but I do need a need double more. rifle for charging white tail does. Yeah, yeah. It's it's fun to shoot too because you've got the double triggers, and uh, you know you've got you got two chances, quick follow up shot. Um, yeah. I know sometimes, I remember when I was looking at um, some shotguns, I ended up with my Browning Synergy, and that's mm-hmm. an over-under. But I remember talking, um, I was talking to Ryan Muckenhern, because he's a big purveyor of uh, side-by-sides and stuff like that. And I remember asking him, like, why in the heck are these side-by-sides and over-unders? Like, why are they so expensive? I was like, they're so simple. They don't have the inertia-driven whatever, you might call it. Yeah. You know, they don't have all that stuff. They're just shotguns you know and he and then he proceeded to explain and i it hadn't occurred to me that two barrels there's two chances for things to be awry if they're not done exactly right and aligned properly and put together in such a way that they're not gonna you know whatever i mean it actually is when you really think about it a really difficult process there's a lot more going on there Yeah. yeah yeah and then this final one i grabbed just because it um it, it's got this weird block on the end of it. Yeah, I was wondering what this is. It almost looks like a like a barn made out of aluminum that you've yeah <laughs> slid down the barrel or something. I don't know. It's it's yep. an interesting thing. It's a big block. Yeah. What is so that? I so I made this. Um, it's called a, a barrel block. Go figure. And uh, it's seventy seventy five T six aluminum um, that is started out as one block. Um, put a little uh, um, interruption here. With these with these clamping screws, and then if you look real close, you can see the aluminum isn't touching the steel. There's like a little liner that okay. separates the two in there. Kind of free okay, floating esque. Yeah. Well, that's that's a thermal um, isolation barrier. So uh, as the this is the chamber end of the barrel. And give me a dictionary out again. Is it as it gets hot, you don't want that heat transferring to this aluminum because the aluminum is actually your mounting surface and your bedding surface to the stock. So if you look on the bottom, you've got two quarter 28 holes like you would find on the bottom of an action. Mm-hmm. You've heard of free-floating barrels. Mm-hmm. This has now a free-floating barrel and a free-floating action. Oh. So the action would be screwed on here, and it's not touching the stock at all. It's just going along for the ride. The only place that this attaches to the stock is through the block here. Wow. Yeah, so this is, you talk about tuning forks. You shoot this thing, and it feels and sounds like a tuning fork because now you have these two steel masses that have their own characteristic frequency that are that are vibrating back and forth when you shoot. Oh my gosh, that is super cool. Yeah, it's 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 pretty neat. Um, you've I got the idea from you see some of these big rail guns and and uh, heavy bench rest rifles that that have this methodology and they're supposed to be the most accurate rifles in the world. So I wanted to see if I could do the same thing, but put it in a little tiny block in a hunting rifle. And um, see how it worked. And did you notice an increase wait, in wait, accuracy? Wait, wait, wait. Did you make this? Yeah. Yep. Yep. Just as a, just as an experiment. Um, <laughs> That's amazing. But yeah, it, it 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 does work, and it's it's pretty cool because it takes away all the sensitivity that you have. You know, like how much torque should I use on my action screws back here and everything? Mm-hmm. You have you have less cantilevered um, weight out front. So this is a thirty-two inch barrel, mm-hmm. but effectively, you get to take six inches off. So, you know, now it's a 26-inch barrel. Is that because... Wait, I'm trying to actually figure out how that works. Well, um, you get the velocity of a 30-inch barrel, but you... but borderline bullpup S. Yeah, it's it's sort of like uh, you're taking taking that relationship between the stock and the barrel, and you're you're just sort of changing where it happens. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. And if you want to know what a bullpup is, check out yeah, our we podcast. We did a talk on that on bullpups. Um, wow! Uh, holy smokes! Mine coming up with so many things, but we're already you know, at an hour twelve. Yep. Uh, 
barrels, though, are phenomenally interesting. Oh, that was what I was going to say, though. Ian um, is going to have Ian's artisanal firewood and (laughs) free-floating barrels and actions. For the discriminating wood burner. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which I am. There are a lot of those out there. Um, man, these have been some very interesting ones to discuss. And I, I did also find it, I, I, I appreciated the way that you put it in such that, uh, you discuss the fact that some barrels that people have are almost these, uh, they're like shavers, if you will, disposable and you shoot through them, you use them while they work. And then when they're done, you take them off and you put on a new one. Now, not all of us are doing that very often. You're obviously in competition. You shoot a lot more than the average Joe. But that is kind of the way that that you can look at it. And then some of these ones are these really nice handcrafted ones. And, I mean, to go and get a new one of these would be quite a process. And somebody would literally have to go in and hand make it. You're you're never going to replicate this exact double barrel setup. Um, Well, and like we talk about oftentimes, it comes back to application, right? It it does. Absolutely. You're just not going to shoot that gun as much as you might a Mm -hmm. different one. So. Yep. Absolutely. And then there's people out there, you know, like we've seen with their ultralight mountain guns, and they have these super thin barrels, and, you know, they know that that gun isn't hopefully going to be used for, you know, like, boom, 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 boom. It's hopefully mm-hmm. one shot. and, and But it'll see miles and miles of trekking, so it's important yeah. to have it light. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Wow. Did we miss anything, Ian? Well, you probably, yeah, we missed a bunch of stuff. I mean, I'm sure, yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, you know, it's barrels. How much can you talk about barrels? They're, they're Apparently no. a lot. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's, there's, there's and, some and different And possibly barrels. a little bit more. Yeah. Probably a little bit more indeed. It's a good uh, starter. As always, though, we'll, we'll leave it on this, and if anybody has any additional questions for Ian about these particular barrels on the table or anything else that we chatted about, definitely hit us up. Uh, Instagram is the easiest way, at Vortex Nation Podcast. And yeah, we got to get some pictures of these. So for those of you listening, if you don't head over to YouTube, mm-hmm. definitely head over to the Instagram page. We're going to get some some pictures of each one of these individually because they are they are unique. Wow, cool. fascinating! Thank As you, Ian. Usual, Thank you guys, and congratulations on the hundredth uh, episode. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thanks. Sweet. It's well, fun. we'll catch everybody next time. Happy hunting and shooting out there. And uh, why don't you go in your safe and tell us what kind of barrels you're rocking on your rifles? We'd love to hear it. All right. Bye. 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 Oh, see the rest of this one? Yes. Heck okay. yeah. I also would love to know if you're comfortable sharing the uh, the cost of such a firearm. Okay, so this one I bought second hand. Um, I think there, there are a couple forums out there, 24 hour campfire, you probably mm-hmm. spent some time on. Sure. I think it was in the classifieds. Of okay. That one. And it was a guy who uh, he's left handed and he said, Hey, the market for this probably isn't very big, but I've got this left handed oh, mini that's a double lefty. rifle. It is in the sense that the stock has some uh, cast off for left. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And I, I was looking for one and I thought, Oh man, this is perfect. Uh, the fact that it comes with um, some 28 gauge barrels oh, my, was I mean, even better. It's oh. amazing. God, yeah, it's so beautiful. This cost, I think it's about. Four thousand dollars. Yeah, but I mean, it's one of those things that yeah, I'm gonna have one of them. Well, I right. mean, like a fine Italian side by side shotgun that you get that's just a shotgun. You know, let's go for eight, ten, twelve more. Yeah, yeah you got a double rifle and a shotgun. And I, I sold a I've couple. I always wanted a twenty eight too, Jim. Yeah, I mean, it's, I didn't is. realize you can get like seven eighths or one eight or uh, one ounce loads for a twenty eight. I. I always thought a 28 oh, was sort of like a. Jeez Louise. It's a lot closer to a 20 than a 410 than I was thinking. Right, right. Gosh, this thing is gorgeous. I don't even yeah, touch it. Yeah, it came with 30 uh, inch barrels, screw in chokes for the for the 28. Um, we'll put this thing together. Marco, this is. Uh, I wish I had discretionary. In this it. is a. This is like um, a Rory gun. Yes. Like if if I headed to the field with Rory, I would need to be carrying one of these with her fine black and brown sleek coat and her pointing. Is that your you? dog? Rory? Yeah, my okay. dog. She's a Gordon Setter, so Scottish uh, breed of Setter and just looks very regal even though she acts like an idiot. You so need that to, would, You uh, need to go to a this state. Is, this, this is the gun version of her. Yes. And you also need to go to a state where you can hunt deer with dogs. And mm. Right. This would be oh, set for up, snap shooting. Set, yeah. set up a drive. Close range. 
This this is cool here. This uh, this yeah. checkering that goes down. That's called like a that. Prince of Wales grip, where it's sort Ooh. of rounded like that. It's uh, <clears throat> supposed to be faster. Your hand can sort of grab that as well. Can the we put it together? Yep. The double trigger is yeah so cool. I'm not a big shotgun guy, so it's taking some getting used to. Um, oh, I can't imagine. Actually, um, you know, learning how to transition to that rear trigger. And it's so, yes. they're, they're so like, they're so petite. Yeah. And it's a rounded action, not squared off. So it's really, it sits really good in your hand. Yeah. Oh, there we go. Yeah. And then this. Oh my gosh. Look at how everything goes together. Everything goes together and just, you can, it just looks. It's truly exquisite. Wow, Mark. I guess. Wanty. But it's got ejectors and it kicks them out. Pretty, pretty good. The detail work on the on the receiver is so yeah. Wow, fine. It's funny Let's because see this thing here. Well, no, not yet. It's a lot of it's a lot of. I mean, it's all steel. So even though it's small and petite, it's actually got a little bit of a. Oh, she's got some heft yeah. to her. But in a good way. It, yeah, it, it feels, feels I mean, you're super steady, yeah. you know? Yeah. I bet the big wow. ones are, are fun to shoot too, but not a lot. Whereas that one, you know, you just shoot. I don't think I'll find myself chasing elephants anytime in the near future. Right. And even if you did, you could borrow a, it's probably easier to borrow a from your right. professional hunter. Exactly. The only thing would be, and that feels pretty. you know, getting to know it and practicing with it to a point where you're like, you know, comfortable shooting elephant in the head at like yes. close range. Yeah. The thought, Which I'm willing to do. The thought of shooting something that's the size of my house. A pachyderm. Yeah. I'd, I actually think that an elephant might not, I mean, Obviously, it wouldn't fit in my hands. It wouldn't fit in anybody's house. But I think that, like, if you just took out all the walls and the roof and everything, I still don't think it would fit. Probably not. House. I knew a guy that had a, like a, I guess you wouldn't call it a shoulder mount, but it's similar. Like and a I almost, mount. I almost think it was like a reproduction yeah. somehow. He would killed an elephant, but I, I, I feel like, but I mean, it's quite like large. A styrofoam or whatever. I think it was like fiberglass. Like it was crazy. Oh, wow. Had the ears flared out and. Yeah, I don't remember entirely. But very, it was very cool. Massive. All right, that'll wrap it up for this episode of the Vortex Nation podcast. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Hit that subscribe button so you can always stay up to date on the latest happenings over here at the Vortex Nation podcast. You can also follow us on Instagram at Vortex Nation podcast. Again, everybody, thanks and happy hunting and shooting. We appreciate it. Have a good one.